YouTube. So if you miss class, it will be available on YouTube within about, I don't know, 48 hours, usually at the most. Um, and because we've got a few people missing today, I'm going to go ahead and do that today. So as I said, I'm Dr. Sherman, Office of Pickall 352. Office hours are going to be 7.45 to 9 a.m., Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and 7.30 to 8, Tuesday, Thursday, and by appointment. I don't even put my phone number on the syllabus because I don't answer the phone. I, I get way too much spam calls here, um, and those calls that are important, people will usually email me, so I just uh, rely on email. Uh, for To email me, don't use the D2L link. Because I don't check the, the, um, the D2L site nearly as often as I check the MTSU site. So email me at ted.sherman at mtsu.edu if you need to contact me. Um, and I'm, you'll usually reach me fairly quickly. I usually don't let more at most than four to six hours go by before I uh, reply. If it takes longer than that, then there's usually something wrong and I'm not um, at my computer or, you know, something like that. Um, the textbook, if you haven't already gotten it, is David Bevington's Complete Works of Shakespeare. This is the seventh edition. Okay, I think that's the one, yeah, that's on there. If you have an earlier one, um, that's okay as long as it's not too much earlier, all right? <clears throat> but anytime I refer to page numbers, etc., it'll be to um, this edition. So if you've got an earlier one, it's up to you to um, follow along. Usually I won't refer to page numbers. I'll only refer to page numbers if I'm talking about introductions. Otherwise, it's going to be axiom line numbers, and there will be a lot of that, okay? So course objectives. <clears throat> To gain a thorough introduction to selected works of Shakespeare, Shakespeare wrote 39 plays. We're going to read, if we're able to get to all of them, I think 12, maybe 13. Um, so a third of what he wrote. We're not going to read any of the long poems or any of the sonnets, unfortunately. Two, to formulate your own critical appreciation and interpretations of Shakespeare. When you write your paper, I, I don't want you repeating what I've said in class. I don't want you repeating what other people have said. Okay, That doesn't mean you don't use secondary sources. You do use secondary sources, but you base your paper upon your interpretation, and you use them to either buttress or oppose your ideas. Okay, um, Three, and we'll talk more about papers later. Three, to improve your own ability to analyze and write about literature. Most of you are English majors. Um, so that kind of comes part and parcel with the territory. Those of you who aren't English majors, hopefully you're English minors. If you're neither an English major or an English minor, um, good for you for taking Shakespeare. Because <laughs> the rest of you are kind of required, but not really. Okay? Requirements. Daily reading of assigned materials, that is, the particular plays. We're already behind because of um, not having class on Tuesday. Um, you're to read this material before each day's class and possible daily quizzes. There will be quizzes. They probably won't be exactly daily. They'll probably be not quite every other day, but somewhere in between there. There might be back-to-back, -back and then we miss a day or two, something like that. Two exams. We'll talk about those in a moment. You've got to recite a portion of Shakespeare to me in person. Okay, um, Minimum 20 lines. 100 points, worth 100 points, so essentially um, five points a line, okay? And then you're going to write one 2,400 to 3,000 word literary critical essay, okay? Not including, by the way, works cited entries or your information at the beginning of the paper, my name, you know, that kind of stuff. Paper must follow or employ MLA style documentation and citation, you know, and for the last year or so, I've been real hesitant about including that because of how MLA has gone completely bonkers and off its rocker by going back to a style that it used to employ literally about 40 years ago, okay, um, with the new 8th edition changes. 
If you follow the 8th edition, that's fine. If you follow the 7th edition or the 6th edition, to me, that's fine as well. Okay? Um, essays due at the beginning of class on April 12th, which is about a week and a half, two weeks before the end of, this, end of the term. Late papers will be accepted only in extreme situations and only if I've given uh, prior approval. That is, you've asked before that date. You don't email me the night before and say, oh, can I have additional time? Because unless there's something really extraordinary, I'll probably say no. Okay? Uh, you have to have a minimum of seven critical or secondary sources for that paper. Okay? I don't like stipulating that kind of thing, but over the last half dozen to dozen years, I've come to um, believe it's almost now required uh, because otherwise students won't. I um, had an upper division course last fall. I did not stipulate any secondary sources and I think all but two papers did not have any secondary sources. So they weren't research papers. They weren't scholarly papers. They were, I don't know, reaction papers that were longer than normal, um, something like that, okay? Disclaimer, syllabus is subject to revision. What does that mean? It means if we take longer than is scheduled on the syllabus to discuss a play, we're probably going to get a little bit behind, which means stuff at the end of the semester might have to get dropped. Okay? I'm going to do my darndest not to let that happen, simply because Every one of the plays I chose for this semester, I chose one because they're really good plays. A couple of exceptions. Um, but two, they're plays you ought to read. You ought to read. What do I mean by that? Reading these plays will make you a better person. That's what I mean. Okay? You take these things into you, you listen to what Shakespeare says, and you will walk away a better person person because of it, all right? Um, so I'm going to try not to drop any of them. What we might do is, I might try to do Midsummer Night Stream in one day, Tuesday essentially. We, we might cover a little bit of it today, but we're going to do kind of some um, background stuff for uh, Shakespeare's period. Uh, what else? Check your email, both your MTSU, the mtmail.edu um, and D2L daily before class. If I have to cancel class for whatever reason, um, I copied and pasted from one syllabus to another. Um, I say in the syllabus for this class, I'll let you know by 7 a.m. For this class, I'll let you know by 6 a.m. Because I know some of you drive you know, from Nashville or have an hour long uh, commute and such. So just to make sure, I would just, you know, first thing, log in, check your email uh, or D2L to find out to make sure we do have class. We will have class unless there is an announcement, okay? Um, students with disabilities, you know who you are. File the appropriate paperwork so that I get the appropriate email from um, that office, which I think I already have for some students. Cell phones, laptops, tablets, etc. Never had to include this policy before, but after the last couple semesters, people are just going bat, you know what, crazy. Um, use of cell phones for calls, texting, selfies, etc. is prohibited. I'm not kidding. Last spring, I had a student in another classroom like this one, but it was flipped where I was facing that direction. She was sitting in that back corner and Again, I'm not kidding. Give me a stack of Bibles. I will swear on it. She spent the first two weeks of class like this. Just sitting there taking pictures of herself. And I finally, I was like, Jordan, put it away. Stop. Oh, sorry, sorry. You know, and then the middle of the semester came and she wondered why she had an F in the class. Well, maybe because she is a narcissist and didn't read at all and didn't pay any attention at all. By the way, if you haven't picked up, I'm kind of blunt, so if you're a snowflake, you might want to leave because you will melt very quickly. Um, 
If you, however, you're a first responder, EMT, fire police, etc., you can have your phone out, just put it on silent, okay? If also you have an ongoing or something happens in the middle of the semester and you have an emergent family emergency or situation that requires you to keep your phone available, one, tell me, and two, keep your phone out and keep it on silent. If your phone buzzes and you walk out and leave, I'll understand why, okay? I won't even, I won't ask you about it. As long as you've told me about it beforehand. Otherwise, I'll say, where are you going? <laughs> okay? Um, and, and if something like that happens or arises during the course of the semester that makes it very difficult for you to attend class, speak to me and we'll work it out. I've, I've had a couple of students, had two last fall, in fact, who, because of either personal situations or family situations, they were unable to make it to class. They both still passed the class. In fact, one of them passed the class with an A, okay? But she kept on track by watching the videos online, submitting, you know, the work when it was due, etc. cetera. Um, laptops. You can use your laptops to take notes. I don't encourage it. In fact, I strongly discourage it. And if you want, I can send you the studies done over the last four or five years that have shown. Students who take notes with class, uh, take notes with laptops, do not retain the information as well as students who take notes by hand. Okay? Because when you're taking notes this way, you're not transcribing. If you're taking notes this way, whatever comes in is what comes out. You're not filtering. Taking notes by hand this way, you're filtering. What are you filtering? Well, with me, about 75% useless stuff and maybe 25% important stuff. Okay? So, take that as you will. Um, you can, however, use your laptop or phone or tablet if you've gotten an electronic text. I don't know if there is an e-text version of this available. There are obviously e-texts of Shakespeare available, um, you know, including the first folio. You can download that and have a facsimile of that on your phone if you wanted to use that. Uh, readings would be different from the text that we are using because he doesn't only reply on the first folio. I'll explain the first folio in a minute. Um, if, however, I see or someone reports to me that you're using your computer or, you know, uh, tablet or whatever to uh, search Pornhub or search Facebook or whatever in class, I'm going to ask you to stop. Okay? You'd be amazed at the stories I hear and the things that I see. Um, classroom decorum has gone out the window. Classroom decorum. Attendance is expected. Arrive, in arrive to class on time. Uh, why? Because coming in late is rude. I, not anybody came in late today because, you know, roads and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I'll make exceptions when we've got snowy and icy weather and things like that. Um, because we meet only twice a week, we'll cover a great deal of material in each class period. It's imperative that you not miss any classes. You're allowed two absences. That is two absences. I'll mark them, but they don't count essentially against you. Okay? Third absence results in a one letter grade reduction. Not third, one letter. So if you had an A, you got a B at the end of the semester. Okay? A fourth, you fail the class. Um, if you're not present when roll is taken or when a quiz has begun, you'll be counted absent or receive a zero for the quiz. And I'll give enough quizzes, I'll probably drop one or two, um, the one or two lowest grades, uh, lowest quizzes at the end of the semester. Let me know in advance <coughs> if you know you're going to miss class. Okay, Not so that I can you know, schedule a makeup quiz for you. I'm not going to schedule makeup quizzes. Okay, There are no makeup quizzes. But so that if it's a good reason, that absence won't be counted against you. For example, we meet Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
you get a speeding ticket in Rutherford County, guess what? You're probably going to have traffic court Tuesday or Thursday morning. Okay? So you're going to miss one of those days. Unless it ends up, you know, being in June or something like that. So let me know if you're going to miss class. Um, late papers will be accepted only with prior approval and only in extreme situations. Papers due at beginning of class, blah, 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 blah. Unapproved late papers will receive an F. An F is a 55, not a zero. Okay? It's a 55. I don't bury you if you turn in your paper late. I hurt you, but you don't get buried. All right? If it's a zero, that kills your semester grade. I mean, it's real hard to dig out of a uh, zero when you've only got three or four total graded assignments. Okay, what else? Um, common standards of decency, courtesy, be quiet while another is speaking, be courteous to others, don't call others, you know, if you disagree with an idea, they say that they're an idiot or moron, it's okay to say their idea is idiotic or moronic, because ideas can be idiotic and moronic. People can be idiotic or moronic, but the very fact that you are registered in an upper level college course means one, you are not an idiot by the literal definition of the word. Okay? So don't go there. Um, two, if you're going to eat or chew gum in class, do it quietly. Don't sit next to the person beside you, open up a back of crunchy, you know, Cheetos so that they start twitching and I've seen that happen too. Um, Failure to complete any assignment, other, well, let me back up. When speaking in class, you should use language appropriate to the setting. I had one student last fall, who actually, you know, what he often said, if you could remove the uh, foul language, was usually pretty good, but it was every other word was foul language, so don't use foul language. Um, failure to complete any assignment other than daily quizzes, <clears throat> will result in failure for the course. That is, if you don't turn in the paper, you get an F. If you don't turn in one of the exams, you get an F. Not for the exam, for the course, okay? Grading, it's real easy. All the points you've earned divided by the all the points possible. It gives me a percentage. That percentage falls somewhere between zero to 100. And you've got the grading scale right there in your syllabus, okay? Um, schedule. As stated above, you're to read these works before each class and be prepared to take a quiz over them as well as to discuss them. Have each play read the first day it is assigned. So, for example, today I had assigned A Midsummer Night's Dream, okay? I doubt that you've all read it. Some of you might have. Some of you might have read it before, okay? But we're not going to get into a Midsummer Night's Dream much today, so you need to have it all read for Thursday, excuse me, for next Tuesday. But then for next Thursday, I've got As You Like It assigned. You need to have read As You Like It. It's only about 40 pages. I know, it's small print, you know, it's Shakespeare, but still, okay? So here's the schedule, essentially. I've kind of roughly divided the semester up into comedies, histories, tragedies, romances, okay? And also roughly into the chron chronological period in which Shakespeare wrote them. Midsummer Night's Dream was written before As You Like It, which was written before Twelfth Night, which was written before Richard II, etc., okay? <clears throat> More or less, a lot of the, you know, when we talk about when Shakespeare wrote certain plays, we don't have hard and fast data. Um, some things we do, but not entirely. So, <clears throat> the first three plays are comedies. Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, and Twelfth Night. Midsummer Night's Dream, perhaps Shakespeare's most famous comedy, the one that is always in production somewhere, <laughs> no matter what time of the year, really. I mean, even in the cold dead of winter, you can find it being played somewhere, okay? If you ever go to London, you'll be able to see multiple productions of Shakespeare during the summer, okay? 
as you like it, probably right up there pretty close to a Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. Um, Twelfth Night, not quite as popular as the other two, but pretty popular. So three comedies, and then we jump right into his histories. Okay. Richard II, Henry IV, parts one and two, Henry V. That's the only, for lack of a better word, series that Shakespeare wrote that we will read in its entirety. Okay? He actually wrote two English history series. They're called tetralogies because there are four plays in each of them. Okay? We're only reading one of them, and the reason we're reading this one is because these are the most famous of the history plays because of the characters of Prince Hal and Falstaff. Okay? Then we have Spring Break, and we're going to come back from Spring Break and have a comedies and histories exam. So we'll have an exam covering all seven of those first plays. It'll be an in-class exam. Yeah, wow. Okay. A lot to imbibe, let's say. And then we come back, and I'm, I'm kind of changing up what I've done from what I've done in the past. We're going to do Caesar, Julius Caesar, Hamlet Lear, and Antony Cleopatra. We're doing those, one, because... Um, I've had some people ask me to cover Caesar, and Antony, and Cleopatra, and there will be videos on the YouTube channel for it. Um, two, the National Shakespeare Festival did Antony and Cleopatra last summer in early fall, um, and I had never read it before then. My son was in the production, and I did a couple talks about it. And it's a pretty interesting play. It's come. It comes from late in Shakespeare's. Um, artistic productions, 1610, 1611, okay? It is a tragedy, but it also follows upon very nicely Julius Caesar because we, see, we have our introduction to Mark Antony and Julius Caesar, and then so we kind of get the rise of Mark Antony and Julius Caesar, and then in Antony Cleopatra, he continues rising a little, and then we see his downfall, okay? So we're, we'll kind of trace that. And because, you know, both those plays are political plays. In, in some sense, some people say, all of Shakespeare's plays are political plays. But those two much more so than many of the others, especially given when he's writing them and, and such. King Lear is obviously a political play. Hamlet somewhat. Hamlet is also being produced this semester, right now in fact, by the Nashville Shakespeare Festival. They're doing it at the Trout Theater at Belmont until almost the end of January. And then I think January... 30th, maybe a little bit later. They're bringing it down to MTSU's Tucker Theater, okay? I'd really like you to go watch that. In fact, I might give a, uh, an extra credit opportunity if you go and see that. From what I understand, I've not seen it yet. They've, you know, done some things I probably won't approve of, but, you know, that's, that's their prerogative. So then we'd have uh, Caesar, Hamlet, Lear, and Antony and Cleopatra. And then we finish with The Winter's Tale and The Tempest. Okay? Tempest, Shakespeare's last totally self-written play. And we finish with that because he says some things in that play that have led some to believe Shakespeare is saying at the end of The Tempest. I'm done. Breaking you know, with the character of Prospero, the magician, breaking his staff, abjuring this rough magic, that that is Shakespeare saying, that's all I got, folks. <laughs> I'm all rode out, you know. And then he goes off to Stratford and dies, essentially, seemingly forgotten, okay? A um, couple other things, and then we'll talk about some background stuff. Plagiarism definition. You all know what plagiarism is, but just to make sure, it's the borrowing of material, intentionally or not, from a source without adequately and accurately showing the extent of that borrowing and or without adequately and accurately citing that source. It's not just not documenting material you've borrowed. It's not showing how much you've borrowed. So if you paraphrase a source and don't indicate where that paraphrase began, you haven't indicated 
how much you've borrowed. Because it's impossible for your reader to determine where your ideas and your voice ends and where that other person's ideas and voice begin. So whenever you paraphrase, you've always got to include some kind of introductory tag. So-and-so suggests. So-and-so contends. Okay? And I'll put a... I already think I have. Maybe I haven't. I'll put a handout up on um, D2L that gives you some guidelines for it, how best to um, handle that problem. Okay? Paper assignment. You'll write one, as I said, 2,400 to 3,000 word. That's roughly 8 to 10 pages, excluding work cited. Paper on a topic of your choosing, but you must obtain my approval of the topic prior to writing the paper. <coughs> I did not do that this, I did not do this this semester, and I probably should have. But I don't have a date by which you have to give me your topic. Um, I might, I might add that in. Because I don't want you the night before the paper is due saying, oh, Dr. Sherman, I've written my paper on. Is that okay? So, you know, get my approval um, in advance. And you can do that merely by asking me after class, sending me an email, asking me before class, whatever. Um, formal academic scholarly research paper. You may not use cite internet sources in your paper. Internet sources. Billy Bob's Shakespeare page. That's what I mean by internet sources. Somebody's independent Shakespeare website. Okay? Project Muse, InfoTrack, um, print materials that are found on internet servers. Those aren't internet materials. Okay? Those are not excluded. I mean individual websites. If you have, if you've come up with a site that you really think you ought to be able to use, email it to me. Okay? You know, if it's something like the Folger Library Online, well, that is an internet site, but that is a scholarly site. Okay? Why? Because it's a library. It's not Joanne's Folger Library site, okay? Um, so if you have any doubts or any questions as to whether something is a solid source, email me and I'll take a look at it and let you know. You're required, as I said, to have a minimum of seven secondary critical sources, such as scholarly articles, monographs, chapters and books, etc., written about the plays you are analyzing. The written about the plays you are analyzing that's what defines them as a secondary source. The primary source is Shakespeare, whichever play or plays you're writing about. The secondary source is what people have written about that particular play or those plays. A tertiary source would be something like an encyclopedia entry. Okay? And you can go all the way down, you know, I don't remember what comes after tertiary. Quarterary, whatever it is. Um, but you want to rely on secondary and primary sources. Um, and I give you some examples of where to look. Shakespeare Quarterly, Shakespeare Studies, Shakespeare Yearbook. You kind of get the you know recurring motif there. Modern Philology, Studies in Philology, ELH, English Literary History. All good places to begin searches. Okay. Follow MLA guidelines, and there's a bunch of stuff. And then I have a Thing uh, formatted in bold at the end. Failure to include a title for your paper. Failure to turn in your paper on the assigned date time. And or failure to follow any of these directions will result in an automatic F on the paper. Okay. And I do follow that. I'll give you a real short version of how I go about grading papers. I collect them all in class. I alphabetize them. And then I just start flipping through, seeing if they have a title. If a paper doesn't have a title, I put it off to the side. I give it a big fat F. That's its title. I don't read it. Why? Because you're too stupid to even follow basic directions. If you're too stupid to follow basic directions, one, you shouldn't be here. Literally, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> Two, follow directions. 95% of success in life. 
simply following direction. Doesn't mean you have to be a lemming. Doesn't mean you're a, a, an unthinking, you know, automaton. It just means, one, you can follow the little basic simple directions, but within that you have all kinds of freedom to do other things, okay? But you gotta get those little things done before you can do the big things. Um, so that's the first thing I do. They've all got that. Then what's, what's the other requirement in the paper? Two, actually. One, word count. Okay. I'm not going to give you an F if you have 2,399 words, because it's supposed to be 2,400. Okay. Nor am I going to give you an F if, well, I might. <laughs> if it's 4,000 words, it's supposed to be 2,400 to 3,000. I'm not going to give you an F if it's 4,000. I'm going to say you need to, you know, be a lot less wordy, okay? But if you don't have the seven secondary sources, if you've got six, what's the problem with six when seven is required? It's not seven. You'll get an F. I had a number of papers last fall. They're still sitting out my... Outside my office, I bet, you know, if students come and pick them up, they're going to be surprised. I had a couple email me. I had one student, A's in everything throughout the class. Final exam required two quotations from each of two books. He had one quotation from each of two books. Got an F on the final exam. Lowered his course grade from an A, probably the highest A in the class, to a B. And he's like, oh, Thought I did that. <laughs> Took it in stride, you know. Um, and then I have some comments about what kind of papers we'll receive, what kind of grades, and what the first page ought to look like. Okay, any questions at this point? I wouldn't think so. It ought to be fairly clear. Okay, so let me move this now. And I did not have time to put a bunch of notes up on the board. So this is all going to be kind of background to studying Shakespeare. When did Shakespeare live? Anybody? Late 1500s, early 1600s. Late 1500s, early 1600s. To be exact, this is 1564 to 1616. We think he was born on April 23rd, 1564. We say we think he was born then because we don't have his actual birth certificate. Yes, they did have birth certificates in that time period. We just don't have Shakespeare's. We have his baptismal certificate, okay, which is dated a few days after that, the date of his baptism. It's the date of the baptism that leads most to suggest he was born on or around April 23rd. One of the reasons we kind of stipulate, okay, it was the 23rd, is because it fits nicely with the day he died, April 23rd, 1616. In other words, he died on his 52nd birthday. Okay. One of the interesting things about April 23rd is it is St. George's Day. St. George is the patron saint of England. And here you have, arguably, the greatest writer of the English language, born on the patrol feast day of the English language, if you want, because it's the patrol feast day of England. It's, you know, it's just nice symmetry involved to it. Okay? So, 1564 to 1616. So he's born in the middle of the 16th century, and he dies early in the 17th century. 
What's going on in the middle of the 16th century? Or what characterizes the 16th and early 17th centuries? Well, we've got to back up a little bit in time. So let's back up to, let's say, Ten thirty one fifteen seventeen, just celebrated the five hundredth anniversary last fall. Anybody knows what that was? It's when Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk in Germany, nailed onto the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, ninety five points of contention. They're called the 95 Theses. Everybody in here knows what a thesis is. It's an argument in paper, right? It's the thing you are going to argue. Luther came up with 95 of these. These were 95 theses he wanted to argue about the church in his own time. These were 95 points he wanted to clarify, these are 95 problems that he saw. Luther never set about to reform, excuse me, to break up the Catholic Church. He set about to reform it, to cleanse it, to purify it. Okay? But this was the spark that caused the Protestant Reformation. All right? Luther wrote these 95 theses. He, he didn't have any takers. You know, the bishop didn't come up and say, okay, Marty, let's you, let's you and I sit down and let's, let's hammer these suckers out. Didn't happen. So Luther wrote these, and then he kept writing. He started translating the Bible, putting it into common, everyday, ordinary German, the form of German that he knew, that is, the particular dialect of German that he knew. And he started attracting a following. Why? Well, because something was invented about 40 years previous. Actually, over 50 years previous, but reached England about 40 years previous. In roughly, I think it's around 1455, you have Johannes Gutenberg invent the European form of the printing press. Now the Chinese had invented movable print much earlier, but the Europeans didn't know about that. Gutenberg invented the printing press. Why is that so important? Because after he invented the printing press, the only way, excuse me, prior to inventing the printing press, the only way any of you could get a copy of this manuscript Pretend this isn't a printed book, but a handwritten book. The only way you can get a copy of this is to pay somebody to copy it for you. And I mean copy it like this. Okay? Very time and labor intensive. But with the advent of the printing press, you can now set these pages into type. And what do you do? You ink that press, and poof, there's one page. Two page, and you can start printing out multiple copies in a week. So the material that Luther was writing starts getting copied and distributed. Think of a grass fire. Real dry grass, you light the grass, and what does it do? It slowly starts to smolder and stuff, and then it starts to burn, and it starts to spread out like that. That's what Luther's ideas do. They start to spread out. Okay? Within four years, people are now taking Luther seriously. Because in 1521, uh, you have what's called the Diet of Verbs, which Hamlet is going to pun on when we read the play Hamlet. He's going to talk about a convocation of words. Okay? A convocation is a diet, not diet. This isn't talking about eating worms, though Hamlet is punning on that form of this. 
It is a meaning. Okay. Verbs is a count. Hamlet is playing upon the slimy things in the ground, however. Okay? At the Diet of Worms, Luther was invited by the Archbishop or Cardinal, I can't remember which, to come and defend his ideas. He said, okay, I'll come, but you have to grant me safe passage. That is, I need a guarantee that I will be allowed to arrive safely and leave safely. That nobody will hinder my progress. Archbishop said, okay. okay. So Luther gets there. He thinks he's finally got somebody who will take him up on his wanting to discuss these problems in the church. Well, he gets there and he finds out he's been set up. They have a table with everything he has written in the intervening four years. And he's a prolific writer. Books, pamphlets, what are called broadsides, right? All there. And he's told one thing. Recant. Take it all back. Say, oops, I was wrong. That's what we want to discuss, Martin. You admit the error of your ways. And Luther said, okay. I gotta think about this. Give me 24 hours to pray about it. Okay. So he goes off, he prays. He's a monk, remember, he's used to prayer. He comes back and he says, essentially, according to his most famous biographer, an American named Roland Banton, he says, unless proven to me by scripture or by my conscience, I stand by every word I've written. Here I stand, I can do no other. Here I stand. This big stack pile of books, it's all true. It's all right. Unless you can prove that I'm wrong by scripture, or if my conscience proves I'm wrong. Well, his conscience didn't prove he was wrong, and they couldn't prove by scripture what Luther was saying was wrong. Okay? So he leaves, because he's allowed safe passage. He leaves, and he's kidnapped. He's kidnapped, however, by his friends, who hold him up in Wittenberg Castle, okay? And he starts writing even more vociferously, okay? So that's 1521. A few years after this, 1528, I believe, King of England, on my notes. No, I don't. 15... No, it's 1521. Same year. King of England, Henry VIII, right, writes a tract against Luther. And because of his writing this tract against Luther, the Pope... Leo the Tenth, yeah, Leo the Tenth declares Henry the Eighth defender of the faith. Okay, this is fifteen twenty one. He declares him defender of the faith because Henry not only writes against what Luther's been saying, but he also defends the supremacy of the Pope. Only problem is, just a few years later, in 1533, Henry breaks from Rome. Why? Because he wants to get married. And he wants to get married because his previous wife, he wants to get remarried, I should say, because his previous wife didn't bear him a son. Well, his previous wife had been his brother's wife. His brother died, however, fairly early on in the marriage. 
And he was able to marry her in the first place. This is Catherine of Aragon. He was able to marry her because Henry asserted and she asserted, well, we never consummated the marriage. Never slept together. Oh, okay. Then it's not incest. 1533, however, kind of the tune changes a little bit. Yes, we did consummate the marriage, and therefore the marriage was null and void to begin with. Okay? So Henry breaks from Rome. Why? Because the Pope won't grant a divorce. This is part of you know, Henry's problems with his various wives. And I'm not going to go you know, into all the ones. So that's 1530. Three, he breaks from Rome. Then, he also issues, same year, two acts called the Act of Succession and the Act of Supremacy. The Act of Supremacy is really the most important of the two. Because what it says is, every good English citizen must swear allegiance to the crown as also the head of the church. This is part of Henry's break from Rome. This is the beginning of the Anglican church. Okay. That's also 1533. 1536. Another guy on the continent, John Calvin, writes his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Okay. Where he lays out what becomes known as Reformed Theology. This is the founder of Calvinism. Okay. Anybody here a Calvinist? Presbyterian? Used to be card-carrying members. Calvinism can be understood by this short acronym, TUNA. Okay? Five main points. This is what all real Calvinists believe. T stands for total depravity. That is, the total depravity of humanity. We are all totally depraved. What does that mean? It doesn't mean we're all Jeffrey Dahmers and, you know, hiding. It means everything we do and think is touched by sin. Everything. So, seeing a homeless person on the side of the road and you give them 10 bucks, giving that homeless person 10 bucks is touched by sin. You're doing that partially because there's some part of you that you're doing that for yourself. You're doing that so that God will smile at you. You're doing that to make yourself feel better, etc. Okay? No matter what the act is, it's somehow tinged or touched by sin. There's nothing good in other words. Okay? You. Unconditional election. So, we're all totally depraved, but God, in his wisdom, chooses some people to be saved. It's unconditional. What does that mean? Nothing I do to deserve it. Nothing I do merits that election. This is God kind of, you know, pulling the, out the wheel of fortune, you know, think. Pat Sajak and Vanna White, and rather than dollar signs on it, it's got names on it. <laughs> and you have heaven, hell, etc. And you spin the wheel and see who ends up. Okay? So unconditional election. It's like you, 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 you save the rest, you go to hell. Because in Calvinist thought, the vast majority of people do go to hell. Okay? L, and that's related to this. Limited atonement. What does that mean? Christ's death on the cross 
was only for the elect. So when St. Paul writes, Christ died for all, he didn't really mean it. He meant he died for all these. Everybody else is screwed. Right? His death was only for the elect. Everybody else is damned. Right? I irresistible grace. You're going to come to see why this is important in a little while. Irresistible grace. Those upon whom God has smiled, the elect, he showers grace upon them, and they cannot resist it. You can't say, oh yeah, you God, if you are one of the elect, you're chosen and grace is showered upon you. It doesn't mean life goes swimmingly for you. It doesn't mean you don't have any problems. It just means you don't go to hell. Right? And P, perseverance, A-N-C-E, of the saints. If you are one of the elect and grace has been showered down upon you, then you will persevere to the end. That is, you will believe to the end. Here's a modern example. Okay? I think most Calvinists would say Billy Graham, he's in the elect. But if Billy Graham, who's still alive, were on his deathbed to say, curse God and die, you know, F you God, that would show by lack of perseverance. He didn't persevere to the end. He didn't stay faithful to the end. One, he wasn't showered with irresistible grace. Why? Because he resisted it at the end. Two, well, there, therefore, he's not part of the elect. See, the, ni the nice thing about this way of thinking is it has a beautiful circular aspect to it. And if you believe it, it's all self-reinforcing. If, however, you start to pull the threads too much, I said I used to be this, I'm no longer, okay? You start to see where the house of cards falls apart. Okay? Even Calvin referred to this as a horrible theology. Okay? He, not saying that he didn't believe it. He did believe it. He just says, Man, this, this is really dour. This is hard to swallow. Okay? Shakespeare is going to play upon a lot of these ideas in his plays, especially Hamlet and Lear. Okay? Especially Hamlet. Hamlet's probably the most religious of all of Shakespeare's plays because he starts right off dealing with issues of hell, damnation, Grace, etc. Right? Let's see, I'm not going to talk about Shakespeare's, uh, excuse me, about Henry's wives and such. Another thing that happened in 1536, and this is pretty important, is you have the dissolution of the monasteries. Okay? This is after, after Henry breaks from Rome makes himself the head of the English church, makes the English church autonomous, okay? He's in the process of raising money for his various French wars. And one of the ways he does that is he, what's called, dissolves the monasteries. Doesn't mean he pours something in the, oh, I'm shrinking. It means he breaks them up. And you have to understand, the church in medieval England and early modern England, the period that we're talking about, the church is the greatest landowner in England. Okay? It's like 50% of the land is owned by the church. So when Henry breaks from Rome and declares himself the head of the English church, himself the crown, the head of the English church, what has the crown just done? Gotten a whole bunch of property, which he can now sell to the highest bidder. 
So a lot of money starts coming into the royal treasury so he can fight his wars against the French. Right? So what does he do? He starts selling off these monastic lands. Right? Some of which are huge. Tens of thousands of acres. Right? But what else happens as a result? Which is why I really hate Henry VIII. One of the reasons why I really hate Henry VIII. Well, one... The monasteries are literally taken apart. The buildings are broken down, and the stone is used to build manor houses and other things like that for some of them. Some of the monasteries, you can still go and see parts of the monasteries. When I take my, um, when I do my um, Harry Potter course in London, just about every other year, one of the places we go, because it was used as a film location, is um, Lake Cock Abbey. Well, Laycock Abbey had been a monastery in the Middle Ages. But Henry dissolved it, and it got sold to a rich guy. Okay? So now what you see is the ruins of the abbey. Almost, take that back, not almost, yeah, take that. Almost every ruined monastery you see today is ruined as a result of Henry. Some are a result of Viking invasions 500 years prior to it. 600 years prior to Henry. Okay. Beginning in the late 8th century, continuing off on up through the 10th century. Like if you go to Lindisfarne, the Holy Isle off the northeast coast of England, that monastery was destroyed by the Vikings. Okay. But Ken Turn Abbey, that William Wordsworth wrote, intimations, owed intimations of immortality, lines written above Ten Turn Abbey. That was destroyed by Henry's goons. Okay? So they took apart these buildings, some of which by that time were 700 years old. Okay? But what else? What were the monasteries known for? Okay, piety, yes. What else? You need a book copy? You take it to the monastery where there are scribes where the monk's job is to copy manuscripts. So the monasteries were the repositories of learning. That's where the libraries were. Well, one of the things that happens as a result of the dissolution of the monasteries, the libraries are destroyed. Okay? It's estimated that we have maybe 10% of all the literature of medieval England survives today. Maybe 10%. The vast majority of it is lost slash destroyed as a result of Henry VIII. Some of it is lost, destroyed as a result of the Viking invasions, but not nearly 10%. Because one of the things that's done is some of these old manuscripts, one, are just burned. Why? Because they support the papacy. They're Catholic, not Anglican. Okay? Two, because nobody can read them. All the material written in Old English, there were maybe a handful of scholars in the 16th century who could read Old English. We know some of them. We know some of their names. Why? Because they wrote their names on the manuscripts they preserved. One of which, for example, is the Beowulf manuscript. It has a guy's name written on it. Lawrence Noel. Called the Noel Codex because of that. He could read Anglo-Saxon. There's only one copy of Beowulf. The name Beowulf only lives in that manuscript in one charter. We don't know if there were other tales about Beowulf. Beowulf, the poem, tells us there are but none others survive. There's only one copy of the manuscript that has Sir Galloway and the Green Knight. Were there others? We don't know. <laughs> and we don't know what other wonderful tales had been told that are now lost for eternity. Okay? So, I mean, this is, if you're an English major, this is pretty, pretty big stuff. Okay? That Henry did. So, Henry dies in 
in revealing, 1508 to, becomes king in 1508. He dies in 1547. His young son, Edward, the, I always mix these two up, sixth, becomes king. He reigns from, what was it, 47 to 53. He's really young. Okay? But he becomes king. He's Protestant. There's a, a kind of protector, Lord protector behind him because he's so young. But he's kind of sickly and dies. And his eldest sister, okay, Henry had three children, each by a different wife. Okay. His eldest half-sister, Mary, becomes queen in 53. She rules for five years. It's from her that we get the name of the drink, Bloody Mary. Why? She was Catholic. She wasn't just nominally Catholic. She was full-blooded Catholic. Okay? To the extent that she had Protestants strung up and burned at the stake. You can go, you know, go to Oxford, get off the bus, walk into town, go in on the um, Broad Street, and you will walk past a monument to two of her most famous murders. <laughs> a guy named Ridley in guys named Ridley and Latimer, one of which was a bishop. He recanted his Protestant faith initially, and then he kind of took back his recantation, and when they lit the fire, he put his hand in first, according to eyewitness accounts. He put the hand that he signed his recantation in first to show, I take back my recantation. I recant my recanting. And it was burned at the stake. We still have that monument in Oxford. Okay? She dies five years later. And then the youngest of the three, Elizabeth, becomes queen. And she rules from 1558 to 1603. One of the longest reigns of any English monarch. It's from her we get the name of the period. The Elizabethan period. It's not called the Shakespearean age. It's the Elizabethan age. Okay? She's Protestant, more or less, especially initially. She kind of takes an approach that would kind of best be categorized as, can't we all just get along? Don't ask, don't tell. I won't ask if you're a Catholic. Don't tell that you're a Catholic. Just do everything under the radar. Just do whatever you want, but do it in your own home. You want to have Catholic Mass? Fine. Do it in your home. Okay? That lasted for a while. Not real long, but for a while. Because Parliament was decidedly more to the right than Elizabeth was. Okay? And Parliament had begun passing some laws, and Elizabeth agreed to them, that essentially said, uh, Elizabeth said, okay, signed off on them. Among those laws, for example, were, imagine this is the interior of a church, okay? Well, these walls would not be blank walls. This would not be, you would not have a Church of Christ church in early modern England, England, okay? You would have images on all of these walls, icons, frescoes, essentially. You can go to the Guildhall Church in Stratford. Okay. where Shakespeare would have attended, at least partially. Okay. And you can see the remnants of the iconography. 
But Parliament passed a law and said all that has to be covered over. Why? Because we don't believe in that stuff anymore. We don't believe in icons as visual aids to faith. Right? Well, when Parliament passed that law, it just so happened, Shakespeare's father was the mayor of Stratford. Shakespeare was just a little boy, a year or two years old. And his father, because he was mayor, it was incumbent upon him to make sure that the church interior was painted over. And he did. But it appears that he did it in such a way that you could still see the outlines of the imagery underneath. See, most suggest, some scholars suggest, take that back, most suggest Shakespeare's family was still Catholic. He comes from a Catholic line. Okay? The Midwest um, region of England was fairly strongly Catholic. Okay? And that's you know where Shakespeare's stock kind of comes from. But his father doesn't Completely whitewashed, as I've said. You know, one of the things that happens with the dissolution of the monasteries, all these monasteries are covered with this artwork, what is today called artwork. Okay? Some of them you can go to, like Laycock Abbey, you can still see in some of the stone the outlines of the paint of angels and such. Others, it's been chipped away, literally chipped away. Okay? So, Shakespeare's raised in this period of anti-Catholic imagery, let's say, of kind of, can't we all just get along Protestantism? But it's becoming more and more stridently Protestant as Shakespeare grows up. Until you hit the year 1588. Anybody know what happens in that year? Spanish Armada. Spain, Philip II of Spain, launches an armada of over 300 Spanish galleons okay, to invade England. He doesn't do it on a blind whim. He doesn't wake up one day and say, hey, you know, I think I'll invade England today. He does it with the backing of Catholics in England. That is, they're going to give aid and comfort to the invasion force. But, the way the Protestants read what happened, by God's divine providence, by his grace, not one of those Spanish galleons landed on English territory. Why? Because the vast majority of them were destroyed by a hurricane. God, looking out for England and her new nickname as a result of this, Gloriana. She who was full of glory. Not Mary, the Blessed Virgin, not that. Elizabeth got the nickname Gloriana. She was chosen by God. Okay? Well, what also happened as a result of this was Elizabeth, Parliament, and a lot of the people turned even more strongly against Catholicism. Why? Because the damn Catholics were trying to take over the country. They wanted to kill the queen. So you get very staunch laws passed against Catholics. For example, it is a capital crime to be a Catholic priest in England. To be a Catholic priest. Whether you're celebrating the mysteries or not, like communion. Just being a Catholic priest is a capital offense. If you do celebrate the Mass, that's another capital offense. Okay? So you start to have these kinds of laws passed. And you start seeing Catholics executed, burned at the stake, drawn and quartered, having their tongues cut out, okay? etc. Fingers cut off so they can no longer write. Things like that happen. Right? Now that 
happens after, as I said, about 1588. Well, look at 1588. How old is Shakespeare then? He's a full grown man. He's got a wife and children by that point. We don't know where he's living, however. So let me jump back to Shakespeare format for our last 10 minutes. So as I said, he's born in 64. In 15, my mind is drawing a blank this morning. What year is this? In 1583, he marries. Um, Anne Hathaway, the other one, the original. Okay, and six months later they have their first child. Notice that six months later. Okay, she's eight years older than he is, if I remember right. She's twenty-six. Yeah, he's eighteen. She's twenty-six. 1582. It's November 1582. Okay? 1583, their eldest child is born. And then in 1585, uh, it's Susanna. 1585, the twins, Hamnet and Judith, are born in February. Okay? And then from 1585 to 92, you have what are often called the lost years. Why? We have no written record at all of Shakespeare for those seven years. We know where he is in February of 1585 because we have his children's birth certificates and baptisms. Okay. We have no written record until 92 where he shows up in a document as being in London. And he's referred to as living in London. We don't know what he was doing in those seven years. Some people have suggested he was a headmaster at a school. No evidence. Some have suggested he was a traveling actor. No evidence. Some have suggested he was living in London the, whole, the entire time, working on his craft. No evidence. Some have suggested he was traveling the continent, picking up his knowledge of foreign languages. Because he had to have known French. Uh, if I remember correctly, he had to have known some Spanish. Okay. He would have learned Latin and Greek as an elementary school kid at King Edward VI school in Stratford, where we're almost sure he attended. He's not included in the rolls, but we're pretty sure he would have attended since his father was the mayor. Okay. Um, but there's no evidence that he ever left England. He just shows up in 1592 in London having his plays produced. Okay. You'll, if you look at the back of Bevington's book, and he gives you know, the canon and dates of the various plays and such. He suggests, if I remember correctly, for example, the Comedy of Errors, which I thought about assigning for this course, but decided not to. <laughs> Commonly assumed to be Shakespeare's earliest play, then it might date from as early as 1588. It might, but we have no hard proof that suggests it does. Okay? But we do know he was in London in 1592, and we do know he was in London from 1592 to about 1612. And then he leaves and goes back to Stratford. So, 1590, let's just take those dates. 1592, 1612. What does he do in that 20 year period? 20 years. And that's even fudging it just a little bit. 20 years. He writes 39 plays. What kind of plays? Shakespearean plays. What do I mean by that? Fully formed five-act 
plays. Not belittling anybody who writes one act plays, but these are not one act plays. These are not episodes of Seinfeld. These are multi-plotted, multiple characters. I think the, the play of Shakespeare that has the least named characters has like 12 characters. Some of his plays have upwards of 30 characters in them. Okay, 39 of these. That comes out to what? Almost two a year. Right? That's not all. Four major long poems. Uh, what do I mean by long poems? These aren't 30 lines. These are hundreds of lines each. Right? And 154 sonnets. Sonnets are 14 line poems. You do the math. 2,000 lines, right there. Okay. Or close to 2,000 lines. All of that in roughly 20 years. When does he eat and sleep? Because again, I mean, some of these we're talking about Hamlet, Lear, Macbeth, Othello, within like a four, five year span. I just named, you know, four of the greatest tragedies in the English language. Perhaps some would say four of the greatest tragedies in any language. Just, you know, they seem to fly off his pen. Okay? But all written during this time period of real, you know, people think today, oh, there's so much social upheaval in the United States. This is nothing compared to, let's say, the 1580s, 1590s, early 1600s. This is nothing compared to 1861 in the United States. Okay? It's nothing compared to 1931 or 1933 or 1942 or 1968 in the United States. Okay? But Shakespeare lives in, one, in this period where things are really topsy-turvy. And then he also lives through and writes through one of the greatest scientific changes we've seen. This change from understanding the way the universe works. Prior to 1610, it was thought by the vast majority of people. There were a few who knew this was wrong, but it was thought the sun revolved around the earth. And that the earth was literally the center of the universe. And the universe was consistent or consisted of these nine concentric spheres that went outside beyond it. Okay? But in 1610, Galileo published his findings that proved Copernicus and Tycho Brahe were correct. The sun didn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolved around the sun. And the sun wasn't the center of the universe. The sun also moved. And that the galaxy we are in also moved. What would that be like today? That kind of change in thinking. Discovery of intelligent extraterrestrial life would probably be close, if not the same. Having the Hubble telescope find something out there that says, I exist, you know, proof of God's existence, okay, that would obviously be bigger. But, I mean, you, you got to understand this kind of mental shift that occurs during this time period. It's, it's just huge. Well, as I said, Galileo did that in 1610. Shakespeare stops writing in 1611 and goes off to Stratford. And then he dies. He dies in 1616, as I said. And when he dies, nobody, apparently, because we don't have them, nobody writes a single poem about his death. This is Shakespeare. 
the greatest playwright of the Elizabethan period. Nobody writes, damn, Bill died. An ode to Bill. Much, much, much more minor poets died, and people produced books of commendatory verse on their death. So why not Shakespeare? Right? It's seven years after he dies that what is called the first folio is published. This is the, I'll bring one in. This is the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays. It's produced, published by his best friends and fellow actors and fellow stockholders in the group Shakespeare was part of. Okay? But a lot of people say, yeah, but he died seven years before that. That's proof that the guy from Stratford really wasn't the guy who wrote the plays. Because if the guy from Stratford was the one who wrote the plays, People would have celebrated his death, and they didn't. How do we really know he wrote those plays? To the extent that a lot of very, very famous people think Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon was not the Shakespeare who wrote the plays. That that Shakespeare was a nom de guerre, a name of war, so to speak. In other words, a writer's name, a pseudonym that he took the name of Shakespeare because the real writer didn't want his real identity to be known. And that that real writer was Francis de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, some say. William, um, Francis Bacon, others say. Who are some of those who say that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare? George Bernard Shaw, for one. Not a slouch when it comes to, you know, English literary history. Mark Rylance, who you might be familiar from because of his recent dabbling into Hollywood, but he's more well known for being the first artistic director of the revitalized, reborn Shakespeare's Globe in London. He was artistic director for the first 10 years. He doesn't think William Shakespeare of Stratford on Avon wrote the plays. Why? A country bumpkin could not be responsible for this artistic greatness. How's that for elitism? Okay, we'll stop there because we're about a minute late. So, for Tuesday, try to have read all of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And we will cover as much as we can.